Hello, everybody. So I'm sorry to do this this way um, again tonight, but I, something has come up. We, we've got to take the cat to the vet and um, couldn't get an appointment until right before time for the meeting. So, and I, I think that this is uh, one of those trips to the vet that she's not going to come home from. So I want to be there with her. Um, so I'm just going to give the talk that I was going to give as part of the service tonight, and um, I'll make it up to you. We'll do the we'll do the service tomorrow if you're on the Zoom call or something like that if you want to. But anyway, um, so we're going through the basics of Buddhism, and there's a and, and there's a discourse and a concept that is pretty important, and and it's also pretty complicated. And it's not that easy to grasp, but I'm going to try to distill it into what's important so that you can take it away from you, with you. Um, it's the, the idea of dependent origination, the 12 uh, factors of dependent origination. So one thing is I want this explains how ignorance or, you know, misunderstanding, irrationality, however you want to put that leads to rebirth. It basically explains the cycle of coming and going and how that happens and why that happens. So, and I want to take a little sidebar here and say that, that there are Dharma teachers and schools of Buddhism that talk about dependent origination and interdependency in the same breath. And there's a very famous Dharma teacher who's that you've probably all heard of that does that. And I, and I won't say it's wrong because certainly these concepts are related, but I think it confuses matters to um, conflate the two of them. Interdependency refers to oneness. Everything, uh, everything is related to everything else is part of everything else. And it's, and that's really more, uh, related to the concepts of not self and the concepts of emptiness than it is to this. When the Buddha talked about dependent origination or dependent co-arising or codependent co-arising or any number of ways that you could translate that, he was talking about something fairly specific. And again, everything is related to everything else. So it's not wrong, I guess, to um, to talk about that and and oneness and interdependency all sort of together. But I think it confuses what the teaching actually was that the Buddha gave. So again, this explains how ignorance leads to rebirth. And then also on sort of the more humanistic side, how we keep coming back to dukkha, to stress and suffering and bringing ourselves back to that over and over again. And once you know how you bring yourself back to it, you can figure out how to stop bringing yourself back to it. So basically, here are the 12 factors. With ignorance as a condition, there are sankaras. So sankaras are mental formations. There's any number of mental formations, but we're talking about things like thoughts and memories and, and those sorts of things. With sankaras as a condition, there is consciousness, awareness, what's going on. In other words, I have a thought. I know that I have a thought, right? So, so consciousness is a condition or a Sankara's mental processes condition awareness. We don't have just pure awareness. We have awareness conditioned by mental processes. With consciousness as a condition, there is mind and body, nama rupa. All right, so what I see is me comes with awareness of me and awareness of other things as well. And so if, if there is Nama Rupa, there is consciousness. With mind and body as a condition, there are six sense doors. So I can be aware of what the mind experiences. I can be aware of what I see, what I hear, what I touch, what I taste, what I smell. Okay. And that, that those six senses are there because of mind and body. With the six senses as a condition, there's contact. So in other words, because I have eyes and the sense of sight, I can see things that are outside of me, right? Because I have hearing and the, 
I can hear things that are outside of me. I can hear Sensei Michelle doing whatever she's doing in the kitchen right now, for example. You probably can too. Um, with contact as a condition, there's feeling. Okay. So I hear something and I decide, and it makes me feel good to know that's going on, or it makes me feel bad to know that's going on, or whatever. I see something and I like it. I had a couple of conversations with somebody lately about the idea of beauty and whether or not it's okay to recognize things as beautiful, or what do you do when you see something as beautiful? Well, you know, if I see that an orchid has just opened up and the balloons are, are really um, extravagant, that makes me feel good, right? So the contact through the eye with the orchid, with the light bouncing off the orchid, with the, with the presence of the orchid, leads to this feeling uh, that's pleasant. With um, feeling as a condition, there's craving. No, not always, but if there is craving, there's craving because of feeling, okay? So maybe I go, oh, I want to bring that orchid inside, put it on the altar, right? That's kind of creating an intention as a result of this feeling. That's not a negative intention or anything like that, but it's the desire to respond to this feeling that you're having that, that is this craving. With craving as a condition, there's clinging. Now I'm going to make a decision to do this. Right. I'm going to maybe somebody else says, no, no, okay, keep this orchid outside. It's better for it to keep it outside. No, no, no. I want it by the altar. I want people to be able to see the see the orchid. Right. So now there's something where I'm attaching to it. I'm actually going to do something with it. And then that clinging is becoming. I bring it indoors and I put it on the altar. Right. That's the the feeling becomes the craving, becomes a clinging, becomes becoming becomes a thing happening right and with becoming as a condition there's birth the orchid ends up on my altar now the, my orchids all happen to be outside right now because they were dropped in their blossoms but you get the idea right and then with birth as a condition there's aging death sorrow lamentation pain distress and despair so when we talk about this in terms of human coming and going what we're saying is that that this self comes into being as a result of these residues of past negative karma that tend to create these sort of patterns in consciousness. And these patterns in consciousness um, determine what form it takes and what form the form has the six sense doors. Because of the six sense doors, there's contact with the outside world. There is awareness of reality and things that happen, things that come and go, right? And with the, that contact, then there's a feeling. I like it. I don't like it. It makes me feel good. It makes me feel scared, whatever, right? At, right? The feeling arises because of the ignorance, the consciousness, the the, I mean, sorry, the ignorance, the mental processes, the consciousness, the mind and body, the senses, the, uh, con the um, uh, contact, the feeling, the craving, the clinging. Okay. So if I start craving something, then I'm going to cling to it. I'm going to want it. When I want it, I'm going to do something about it. It's going to become. And, and so this form is taking place, and that's going to lead to birth. It's going to lead to the coming into being of, of me. right? And the coming into being of me, and the, as soon as I'm born, then conditions are in place for aging and death and sorrow and lamentation and pain and distress and despair. Okay. So the takeaway of this is that our experience of events comes equipped with baggage, including ignorance, delusion, and irrationality. And look, not all Sankaras are based on delusion and an irrationality. It's just that some of them are. The clinging ones, the clinging ones are, right? But our reactions to what happens are colored by these 
these mental processes that that brought are part of our coming into existence. So, <laughs> confused yet? All right. So if we unpack this a little bit, you know, there's five aggregates: nama rupa, name and form. Form you can see, and then there's things that you can feel, that you can measure and accept, etc. So that's the form. And then there are things that you can only name. Sensations, perceptions, mental fabrications, mental formations, and awareness. So consciousness is a requisite condition for me, for, for nama rupa, for name and form, for mind and body. And it's mind and body that identify as me. So let's say that I'm driving on my way to White Sands Buddhist Center on, on some Sunday in the not too distant future. And I'm driving down the road and a driver cuts me off in traffic and it cuts me off in traffic so bad that I have to like swerve onto the shoulder and actually end up stopping. So I saw the driver. Okay, that's contact. Through the sense doors, I, I am... My mind is in contact with the reality of this driver and what he did. So that contact is predicated upon the senses. If I didn't see him, there was no contact. And contact's predicated on mind and body. The senses are predicated on mind and body. There has to be a me to be there in order for me to, to hear, hear it. So the whole, you know, if the tree falls in the forest, does it make a sound thing? Not if you're not there. All right, be not the way we define it this way. There's no hearing if there's no mind and body present. If awareness comes with ignorance, irrationality, delusions, misperceptions, things like that, then um, that's going to affect the feeling that arises. So if I th think that all that I'm a perfect driver and all other drivers should be perfect and there's no way I could have been in the wrong and this guy shouldn't have done that and all of that, the feeling that's going to arise is going to toward that driver is going to be pretty negative. Now, first of all, there's probably a feeling that's going to arise without me thinking about it very much because things come in through the senses and go straight to the part of the brain that's highly reactive without and bypasses like conscious thought. It's still conscious. It's just kind of subconscious conscious, right? You're aware of it, just not in, in that sort of um, uh, uh, executive function kind of way. You react very quickly. I probably stopped by the side of the road with my foot on the brake before I even realized in that sort of awareness, thinking about it since that I've been cut off, right? You've all had that experience where you reacted to something and then you realized you reacted to it. So you have this sense of this feeling that arises as a result of that. That's probably your heart beating, right? And your mouth going dry and that sort of stuff, okay? Um, and then all of these other things come into play and so you start to interpret that. And so then that's when things like craving come into place and clinging. I need to catch up with that guy so I can get his tag number so I can call the cops and tell him I want to, you know, whatever, whatever you think, right? That's, that, that's where, if you're really irrational, if the, if the Sankaras associated with your particular form of ignorance and delusion that came about from previous existences are, are highly negative ones, you could end up with in a road rage situation and trying to harm somebody, right? That's where this can go into real serious suffering. So, and that would be where the becoming comes into place. Here I am chasing down somebody on the interstate with a, you know, handgun or whatever, right? Or trying to catch up to him so that I can write down his tag number and report him or whatever. In other words, I'm doing something stupid, which can lead to what? Right. I'm becoming, uh, you know, a person who's doing something that's going to lead to suffering. So it's not just the cycle of being born and dying and being reborn and dying. It's the cycle of coming back to suffering over and over again in life. I think that's the useful thing. So the really useful thing is to is to be aware that at any point you can break this link of causation. 
there's a number of, there's 12 <coughs> factors, 12 links between ignorance and, and suffering. And if you sever any of those links, then, then you don't experience the suffering, right? So um, let's say that, so like I'm, you know, like everybody else, I put on a few pounds during COVID. So now I want to lose those and a bunch more besides, and you know, all that stuff. So let's say I go to the grocery store and I see potato chips. I love potato chips, right? So somewhere in my mind, there's this idea that eating potato chips is going to make me happy, right? Now that's delusional. Eating potato chips is going to be slightly pleasant for a little while. And then it's probably going to give me heartburn and then it's going to keep me from losing weight. Right. So, but part of my mind, there is this Sankara, this middle process that says that potato chips are, are going to be really good and make me happy. Okay. So um, I could be born a little heavier or I could recognize, oh, look, I see potato chips and that's causing this craving. I can let go of that. That's not going to be good for me. Let me go buy some celery. Yeah, like that's going to happen, right? Yeah. But you know, you know what I mean? You, you don't have to, just because you have the clinging, just because you have the craving, doesn't mean you have to get to the becoming and the birth, right? So you can notice that link and you can sever that link and then the ignorance doesn't become the suffering. So um, there's a, we do this a lot during meditation, you know, thoughts will arise or feelings, physical sensations, things like that. And you'll have this urge to move, to fidget, to chase after the thought, to reimagine the story, all that stuff. And then, and you're seeing in, in, in a very small microcosmic sort of controlled way, what goes on with these factors of, of dependent origination. And you can practice severing those links between the feeling that arises and the becoming that happens, right? So um, that's one of the reasons we meditate is to do that. Now, there is another teaching that you don't hear about nearly as often, but that I think is equally important, if not more important, which is called transcendental dependent origination. So this explains that liberation comes about because of dukkha, because of suffering, that freedom from dukkha, freedom from stress and suffering and sorrow and all of those things is dependent on dukkha itself. Right? In other words, the first step in transcending suffering is to recognize and know suffering. So look, I, when I was growing up, my father smoked. He's uh, and um, I think he told me once that he started when he was 13 and he started drinking when he was 14 or 15 and he pretty much never ate a meal that didn't include meat, preferably fried with, you know, batter on it and gravy. And if you question the wisdom of that lifestyle, he would say, well, it's not a problem. Um, he enjoyed smoking and that was that. Didn't like his drinking. Well, that was your problem uh, and so on. And so his lifestyle cost him a series of wives and relationships with children and stepchildren. Not the meat part, but the drinking part was a big problem for him. And he died a few days after his 70th birthday. And at the time he had emphysema, diabetes, and heart disease. So, and he'd collapsed on the floor of his garage after going out to buy cigarettes and beer. So he never acknowledged that those things were suffering, right? That that the clinging to the fried food and the gravy and the, you know, the carbs and the, um, uh, and the tobacco and the alcohol, he never acknowledged that those things were suffering. So if you want to transcend that kind of stuff, you got to acknowledge this is suffering. And then you, you um, can get out of that cycle once you do that. So, um, you know, a lot of those time, a lot of times, those things in themselves are not that big a deal. You can have 
chicken fried steak once in a while if you want to. You can have a beer now and then if you want to. You might even smoke a cigar once in a while and it not hurts you. But when when you are con- attached to it to the point that it's kind of dictating your life, well, then you need to transcend that. So um, every once in a while, you'll hear somebody talk about the idea of embracing your suffering. If you want to transcend suffering, then you've got to embrace it. You don't really need to. I, I think I think what you need to do is recognize your suffering. So the 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 way transcendental dependent origination goes, you recognize suffering, and from recognizing it, then you start to sever the links that lead uh, from ignorance to suffering. And when you do that enough, then the chain of causation changes completely. And what happens is the recognition leads to freedom, right? Dukkha leads to letting go. Letting go leads to freedom. Um, There's, there's you know, kind of a longer explanation to that. and And I'll talk about that one of these days. But the important thing is to recognize, if you recognize Dukkha and you recognize that this is suffering, then you can recognize then you can realize what to do in order to let go of it and the result of that is that instead of coming back to, to birth and death and sorrow and despair and all of those things you come to freedom from that so um, anyway I hope that um, I hope that this was helpful to you and um, I hope to see you tomorrow on the zoom call And again, I apologize for not being able to be here, but, you know, sometimes that happens. So um, have a great night and I'll see you again soon.